PCNs will be line level officers. So roughly, I apologize that I don't have it directly in front of me, but roughly um, eight to ten support positions total, and that includes myself and my administrative team to help us do this work. Okay, and a follow-up? Follow-up. So can, can you at least give me a ballpark of how many you think that there is that's currently in prison waiting trial? And, and I don't I don't want to divide it by institutions, just a ballpark of those that you're going to be ready to, to take as soon as this gets off the ground on January 1st. Through the Chair to Representative Wilson, there, there are approximately 1,500 individuals who are currently on pretrial um, in an unsentenced status in the institution. Um, what we don't yet know is well, the assessment tool helps us get um, some predictions. We can make some projections based on what we think might happen. What we really don't have a sense for yet is the decisions that the judiciary will make um, when it comes to actually who gets supervised and who doesn't. We'll be making those recommendations, but it is, it is at this point a little difficult to put some numbers on it. I, I have a sense just based on a total projection, but I don't know what that immediate number will look like from the institution. And follow up, Mr. Chairman. Follow up. So going back to also probation and parole officers, um, Commissioner, do you know how many um, on average a probation officer has and how many a parole officer currently have? Uh, through the chair, Representative Wilson, this is kind of hard to answer. Um, there are some officers that have very specialized probation officers doing specialized work. So part of Try not to avert your, I'm trying to get to the heart of your question, I think, which is this, is that, so workload, seven, uh, the amount of people on a caseload is representative of some of the work, but not a very good indicator of the level of work on some cases. That's the problem that um, the amendment causes me as the commissioner. I understand the intent and believe and agree with the intent of what we're trying to do because of overloading the system and the probation system is not a good thing. The problem is that 30 cases or 35 specialized cases may be a maximum capacity. I mean, that could, be a, that could be a full load. There may be other cases where very low risk individuals, 100, 125, 130 may not be. And so we've divided some of our offices up. Um, I know I, my deputy director of probation is online too if you want to ask her directly. Uh, about what she has in caseloads. My concern is the committee to understand that numbers do matter, but it's really the workload of the numbers that you have them doing. So there's more re-entry efforts now that our probation officers are doing. There's more of a workload on that because that's the focus and should be. Um, so in some cases, 35 or 40 might be too much depending upon the caseload. In another case, 125, um, may not be because they're low-risk individuals and your responsibilities for them are much lower than they would be otherwise. That's the difficulty. Uh, I understand the intent, but that's the difficulty of setting that bar for me not to exceed and accept emergency circumstances per person. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Wilson. <clears throat> I think uh, Representative Guttenberg, was it on this or did you have a new question? It was, well, it's along the same line. Okay, Representative Gutmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Representative Wilson's com questions about pretrial are in some ways different, but also very much the same. So, you've got pretrial, and that's a specific population, and that you've got people let out of jail without probation, and then you have people in probation. But in all those situations, there are some programs that are people that people are in that require, um, lack of a better term, oversight, um, uh, counseling, um, and I mean we know it. We know in in schools, it's a, the effectiveness of having people of having counselors is high. But in those three programs, regardless of whether it's pretrial or you know, released from jail, whether or we have programs for them also, whether we have oversight of them or not, and, and post uh, probation, what is the success, the, the, for me the point is the success rate in reducing recidivism. So that is really the point of where we're trying to go. The amendment is just focusing on probation officers. Having a, a caseload of probation officers who have a wide range of responsibilities with their probationary officers is not over. Is overloading them directly matter, or does the oversight that they have over their prisoners um, allow drive the recidivism rates down? 
That's really the question, the, the caseload question. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Mr. Co-Chair, um, uh, I would, would you want to yeah. start there and I'll maybe finish if that's okay, uh, Representative Gutenberg? Yes, um, through the Chair to Representative Gutenberg. What, what I particularly appreciate about that question is this gets really to the heart of evidence-based practices. So one of the um, tenets of evidence-based practices is not to overwork a low-risk defendant. And that is historically what Corrections is really good at. And here's why. Because low-risk defendants show up. They're nice. They give pauses of your analysis. And so we really like working with them. But the tendency is for us to want to work with those folks. And so those folks stay on supervision way too long. So when we use evidence-based practices, one of the things we learn is we actually increase recidivism when we overwork low-risk caseloads. So as you think about managing these programs, one of the things you have to think about is how do you motivate your employees to get the right level of attention to the right level of client, right? We also know that if you provide high levels of surveillance and oversight to a moderate to high risk defendant, you get better results with, with a more intensive look at those individuals. So having higher caseloads for low risk people makes sense because you get less time and attention for those individuals who are naturally compliant. For a higher risk defendant, you have lower caseloads so that you can really target and surveil those individuals for better outcomes. And, and Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Co-Chair, uh, through the Co-Chair, uh, uh, Representative Gutenberg, I think that's exactly right. I think the, um, the intent of the, and I don't want to speak for the sponsor, but, but um, of, of making sure we have a manageable probation workload and is really also, what's really more important to me is I think what representative, I mean what uh, uh, D Director uh, uh, Fox is, <laughs> oh, sorry, Fox is getting at, uh, which is um, that you really want to make sure you're utilizing the right amount of supervision for the right person. That's where the focus should be at for us. Uh, I am concerned about the caseloads that we have on probation, but there's some other key components that in terms of how we switch the department over to I think more evidence-based evidence models of supervision that are actually far more important to this. I'm not trying to dis discourage or dissuade this. I'm just saying if we want to get at recidivism, uh, I can tell you there's a whole litany of other things that I would go at in terms of recidivism issues and why a recidivism rate has not changed in 20 years. A lot of that is what happens behind the walls, not what's just occurring in supervision. But the other thing is to make sure we're getting very smart about how we're supervising. And I think some of the good things that are in the Senate Bill 91 about probation, supervision, and, and earned compliance credit, which I know is coming up, um, those are really important strategies. And so um, I, I appreciate the heart of the intention behind it. I just think there are other areas, as Director Fox said, are really the most important aspect to get right. If I may, Mr. Chair. Representative Kuttenberg. The way you manage your caseloads, where you put the pressure on the low risk and the, and the pressure or the lack of pressure on the low risk and the high risk, we leave that, that up to you. Really the question, and we have, we can get into other things on how we reduce recidivism, but this is the amendment that says you have, your, your probation officers have two overall and how you manage them is yours, have too large of a caseload. That's really the question here. Does that, I mean, you can, we'll give you the, for you to manage, you know, you can give all the low, the low uh, priorities to one person or all the high priorities to somebody else or manage them or balance them between things. That's your business. We don't micromanage your personnel. Some of us want to, but, but do you have enough people to do what you need to do. That's really what it is in the end of the day. Uh, through the co-chair, uh, Representative Gutenberg, I'm, before I ask you for more resources about an area, I want to make sure that I need them and that I am completely justified in my own mind and with my team's mind about asking for more resources. This is not an area that um, I've asked for uh, we have reducing probation counts right now of a fairly significant nature. That's good. But we're at the same time asking them to do more. That's another balance of the work issue. So I don't want uh, my probation staff to understand. I'm, throwing, I'm not throwing them under the bus by not asking for, for more officers or setting a minimum caseload. I'm 
concerned about the restriction that this specific amendment tap, caps out 75 and what that might cause, what problem that might cause for me in mixed offices, for example. We have some offices who we want to do field probation and we want to do pretrial. Well, we know they can take far more pretrial because they're really some of them, they're not really going to be doing much with them. So I want to, if I get over 75 in those offices, then what do I have to do? Do I have to have another staff because now I'm over the limit? Because it's not an emergency circumstance. That's what <laughs> causes me concern about um, um, you know, with this amendment and asking for more resources without a really thought through strategy about where we would put them and um, that's why I'm struggling with whether or not this is really in our best interest and, uh, and in some ways I, I'm not sure it is. Uh, I'll let others continue that train of thought. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Guttenberg. We have Representative Grimm and then Guerra. Uh, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. And, and I, I will go on that line of thought. Representative, um, uh, re regarding caseloads, I, I, I also agree with the intent. I think it's a great intent that we've heard from different departments in, on caseloads, on, on burnout, and, and, and how they affect. And I know that obviously probation and parole officers have a, a, a high a high burnout. I think nationally, it's it's a it's extremely tough job. Um, regarding that, talking about recruitment and retention here in our state in this position. Um, if we, if we talk about the struggles you might have in that regard and if we have unfilled positions where knowing that this might exceed, the caseload might exceed and we, we might need more positions, do we have unf unfilled positions? And, and if we do, <coughs> why so, I guess? Uh, through the co-chair, Representative Gren, we do have unfilled positions. Uh, not as severe, I think, as we have more, quite frankly, in the correction officer ranks right now. But we have, I know that there's 10 to 12, I think, right now, uh, vacant positions in the probation ranks, different offices. Um, why that is, I think Commissioner Monaghan actually had a good answer about asked about why trooper positions are unfilled. Um, there's a couple things, and I'm not making them just, you asked me, I'm going to answer. Um, one, we need stability. We need predictability in these areas of work. You need to know that people are going to have a job and they feel supported and so some stability, and this is not a political statement, just this is a commissioner statement. Fiscal stability and knowing what goes forward and how many positions you're likely to have and having employees feel that, yeah, this is what's going to be around and we're, we have a long range plan for what it's going to look like. Uh, that provides comfort for people and why they come to work and why they stay in a job. I've been concerned about the pretrial division, for example, for exactly the very same reasons. Talk about overall repeal. Who's going to want to work in this division? This is brand new work. It's very challenging work. It's a new system, a new division. There has to be some stability, commitment that this is, we're going to do this. We set a course and we're going to try it. And employees want to know that that is, we mean that. Um, and otherwise, it's hard to recruit. Money matters. I think Commissioner Monaghan said that too. Money absolutely does matter, no doubt about it. But stability matters. A stable workforce matters. Mm -hmm. Things like you're going to have a job tomorrow matters. Uh, feeling supported matters. Appreciation matters. All those things matter, and that, um, that's a factor of, of getting people to work in difficult jobs. Representative Greg, follow up. Um, on that recruitment, on that unfulfilled positions, is it is it regionally where, where it gets tougher? Is there, is there places in, in, the, in the state that unfulfilled positions have been that way longer, or, or is it just kind of across the board tough? Uh, through, the, through the co chair, Representative Gren, I, um, well, I know my direct, deputy director of, of probation is on. She would probably have a better answer. I'll just answer it generally. And if you want to dive in more, I'd ask her to answer more specifically. There's certainly some offices or certain rural 